man that has walked on water, healed the sick, raised the dead. And here to tell you about that man is Brother Dave Wilkerson. I should have said you're going to learn to love repentance. We should learn to love repentance. You know, it's an amazing thing. Oh, by the way, I've learned to appreciate Pastor Benson. I see a strength in him that's very rare today. Uh, good, solid, quiet strength in God. And he's assured me that he believes I'm here in God's divine order, and I believe that. And he told me to take my liberty, which I plan to do. But you know, I'm amazed, Pastor Benson, everywhere I go, I'm, good, I'm glad I don't know it before. I don't like to sit down with pastors prior to meeting, or I'd be scared out of preaching what I want to preach. Not that the pastors would scare me out, but I, I always get this. I got it in Toronto. I get it everywhere I go. Brother Dave, our church has come through such great turmoil, through such repentance, such refining. Up in Toronto, I, would, I was told later of all the foot washing services were, and they usually don't do that, but the pastor hugged the naked feet of his men and there was confession and heart confession. And, and uh, I was in one great church in the East recently and after three hard messages, because the word of God's a hammer, and it was hammering and hammering at sin. I said, Pastor, do you think your church is all repented out? He said, oh, yes. He said, there's nothing left. <laughs> and I got up. I, I was almost sorry for the message I had to preach that night. And I started, I said, Lord, I've got to just back off tonight. I just want to, I'm going to bless everybody, Lord. And suddenly God came on me and I turned to the pastor, who's a dear friend of mine, said, Pastor, we don't know what's in the hearts. We don't know. And God does. There are many, many people who have gone through lip repentance, but the heart hasn't been touched yet. And God thundered and lightning out of heaven that night, and a third of that audience came running down. Both he and I were shocked, horrified at the fact that that could have been missed. You know, before I preach tonight, I want to show you something. And, and this is what God dealt with me about this afternoon in prayer. Deuteronomy 5. I'm not preaching. By the way, uh, you heard what I said. If you don't have your Bible, you're naked. And don't come. Boy, I'll tell you about the third service when I'm in a meeting. As soon as I get up, right, grabs your Bibles. I saw you doing it tonight. Grab them, hold it there, and hold on to it, because we're going to go all through it again tonight. My message, in a little while, I'm going to preach on hatchet gods. I'll get to that in just a moment. Deuteronomy 5, 20. Let's start at verse 23. No, let's go down to verse 28. Verse, uh, Deuteronomy 5, verse 28. I'm not preaching yet. I'm just setting you up for the preaching. And I'm not trying to be facetious. I mean every word of it. And I'm reading from the New American Standard. New American Standard, but I checked the King English this afternoon, and it's very close. And it's, it's the same thing, just, if, just uh, uh, a clearer meaning, I think, in New American Standard. It's really brought to life. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I've heard the voice of the words of this people, which they've spoken to me. They have done well in all that they have spoken. Now, friends, do you realize they've been at Mount Sinai? They've seen the thunder. They, they've seen the lightning. They've heard the thunder. They've seen the holiness of God. And these people have had the fear of God implanted in their hearts. And they have said the right words. They've done the right things. He, he, he said, I've heard what you said to me. They've, you've done well in all that you've spoken. But look at the next verse. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. Do you hear what the Holy Spirit is saying? Your words are right. You can come up here and give the right words. You can, you can say the right words. You can weep the right tears. You can weep them. But he said, oh, that you had a heart. 
Not just your lips, but your heart. All that you would cast down your idols. And it's not enough to come to the house of God and repent and say, I, 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 I'm sorry, Lord, and go to one another and repent until God has all our heart, until all the idols are cast down. You can't come to church and weep and cry and confess your sins and go right back and sit in front of your idol. You can't, these young people, go out there and, and turn on your rock and roll records. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really... I've done something tonight I very seldom do. I'm bringing a magazine to the pulpit. Never thought I'd do it. I wrote a book. It's just been released called Set the Trumpet to Your Mouth. And, and the one chapter... No, no clapping, please. The one chapter that's brought me more grief than anything is, is music of devils in the house of God. I, I have young people... You know, they, 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 don't only, they look over the first chapter. It says a holocaust has come. There's a meltdown. They forget all about the meltdown. They forget about the message of judgment because I touched their idol. They, I touched their idol. I have kids lined up. They follow me outside and they get so mad because I'm touching their idol. I don't believe there's anything, any such thing as Christian rock and roll. There's no such thing. No clapping, no clapping, no clapping. This is not a show. There's life and death with me. But you know, I, it's an amazing thing. Even preachers have been fighting me on this. Young preachers who've been raised in this and they're using it in their churches. Somebody of God included. And look at the headlines of this week's People Magazine. Has rock gone too far? And this is a frightening thing. I just saw it here in your town and it's a frightening thing. Because three senators' wives now are so upset at this MTV, or what do you call it, these videotapes, and what's happening, that they're, they're, they're starting a national campaign. Isn't it amazing that the preachers are not doing it, but these people have to do it? Let me give you, young people, let me give you the definition. This is out of Rolling Stone. Here it is, I've underlined it. Get a magazine, isn't Dave Wilson? This is stronger than my book. This, here's the definition of rock and roll right out of Rolling Stones. It says, according to the Rolling Stone Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll, the term rock and roll is a blues euphemism for sexual intercourse. And then it says, period. Period. No other definition. Now you tell me there's Christian rock and roll. There's Christian intercourse. There's sexual intercourse. Outside of marriage? Read it and weep. I wish I'd have had that when I wrote the book. I didn't need it though. I heard from heaven. I heard from God. I didn't want to get it out of a magazine. I heard the, I heard the echo of the heart of God. Hallelujah. And I'm not going to let the devil put that weapon in your hand. I'm not going to, I'm not going to smash your rock and roll. I'm not going to come against that. I'm going to give the word of God. We're going to get right into it, uh, right now. We're going to get into, to the word, hatchet gods. Go with me to Psalms, please. Psalm 74, and just open the Bible on your lap. How many love the word? Raise your hand, please. Wave it at me. You love the word and you tremble at the word. I'm going to give you a Bible tonight. Not David Wilkerson and not my theology. Nothing I got out of any other book but this holy Bible right here. Glory be to God. Now before we read it, we're going to pray. You get Psalm 74 and open it on your lap. Boy, if you didn't bring your Bible, I don't know. You better listen awful close. Every head bowed, please. Heavenly Father, you're my covenant partner. And I've called heaven and earth to witness tonight that I walk in covenant with the Holy God. And Lord, there's thunder and lightning from this pulpit tonight, but it's in tender love. It's in tender love because we grieve over the souls of our young people and we grieve over the souls of Christians who are being led astray by the doctrines of demons. Lord, I thank you for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. But Lord, we're in a spiritual warfare now and you've got to open the eyes of the church. My Lord, you're raising up holy standards now. You're crying out against the filth and the abomination that is in the land. Give us, Lord, ears to hear the word tonight. Pull down the stronghold of the enemy. Oh, Lord Jesus, we know that you've defeated Satan, but the church is in compromise tonight. There's a harlot church, Lord, that's existing today among many denominations. Lord, I see a holy bride rising out of that harlot church, a holy separated bride, young people who will shake off the bonds of iniquity and say, I'll walk in holiness with clean hands and a pure heart. 
Holy Covenant God, manifest your holiness among us tonight. Manifest your holiness, Jesus, that we can sit here in your awesome presence. Be magnified, O Lord. Let your righteousness be lifted up in our hearts. We pull down in Jesus' name every lying spirit, every principality and power of darkness that would come to hide the word and take it, Lord. Pastor prayed just before the service tonight with us. Lord, there are birds that would come to steal the word. Who are those birds but the lying spirits out of hell? Lord, we want to chase those lying spirits away tonight. We chase them away in Jesus' name. We bind them. You said what shall I bind in earth shall be bound in heaven. So I obey you, Lord, and I bind. I bind in Jesus' name the powers of the devil, the prince of powers and powers of darkness. I bind them tonight. Let there be freedom. Don't let the word be taken by these evil birds. Not one of the word be taken from their hearts tonight. Give us hearing ears. And open hearts. I'm ready to preach, Lord. I'm ready to preach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tremble at his word. I tremble at his word. Let's go. Psalm 74. Now remember, I'm reading out of the... The New American Standard, uh, I recommend this Bible. Oh, I recommend it. There's a holiness in it. I, I, no other. I, there's nothing else that's touched me like this. I, I, I've always been just King James, but when I fell on this, friends, it just it's so close to the original Hebrew, especially in the Old Testament, and I just love it. It's opened up so much. I've compared it with Helen Spirell and all the other great Hebrew Bibles, and, and it's so precious to me now. I begin to read the first verse, 74. Are you ready? All right, just follow me, please. What a prophecy. This blew me away when the Holy Ghost opened it to me. Oh God, why hast thou rejected us forever? Why does thy anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Do you see it? Why do you smoke in your anger against the sheep of thy pasture? Not the wicked, not those outside of his pasture, but the sheep of his pasture. Remember thy congregation which thou hast purchased of old, which thou hast redeemed to be the tribe of thine inheritance, and Mount Zion where thou dwellest. Turn thy footsteps toward the perpetual ruins. The enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary. Thine adversaries have roared in the midst of the meeting place. Who do you think that adversary come as a roaring what? A roaring lion. Who is it that roars in the will in in, in in, in the meeting place, right here, in the midst of the meeting place, the adversary that roared, where? In the midst of the meeting place, in the sanctuary. Where is he? He's in the sanctuary of the heart of church. Now, he is not in the sanctuary of those who have clean hands and pure heart. Get that. But he's in the meeting place, in the heart of church. Thine adversaries have roared in the midst of thy meeting place. They have set up their own standards or enzymes. Their standards for signs. It seems, you see, they're not, they're not satisfied with just setting up their standards. They've got to tear down the old ones. It seems as if one lifted up his axe in a forest of trees. And now all its carved work they smash with hatchet and hammer. They've burned thy sanctuary to the ground. They've defiled the dwelling place of thy name. They've said in their heart, let us completely subdue them. They've burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. We don't see our standards anymore, our ensigns. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. How long, O Lord, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn thy name forever? That's as far as I'm going to read. Now look this way, if you will, please. David is prophesying. Do you realize that all these prophecies in the Old Testament are dual prophecies? They spoke to a little Israel and they spoke to a spiritual Israel. And they speak to us today. I see this 74th Psalm as one of the most vivid prophecies of what's happening in the heart of church in America today and in the land. David incredibly is saying God's anger is smoking against the sheep of his own pasture. He's smoking against what is supposed to be a purchased people, a redeemed people, a people within whom he has dwelt. He said in Mount Zion, his church, they're spreading a ruin. Look at it there. The enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary. Within the denominational ranks, there is a ruin setting in. It's there. It's in black and white. It's in your Bible. He said there's an enemy roaring in the midst of the meeting place. 
We know who that roaring lion is. It's all through the word of God. And he said, they've set up their own standards for signs. They are the standards of the roaring enemy, the roaring lion. They're not the standards of the lion of Judah anymore. They're demonic standards. They're devil-inspired standards. These standards are being set up in the house of God by lying spirits. And we're being told, especially our young people, this is the new wave of the Holy Ghost. This is the new standards of the Holy Ghost. This is the way God is moving. That's why in the past two months I've had so-called Christian punk rock groups in my office. Ride their way into my office. And they look in my face. And I say, I've just been shut in with God for five months. I've heard the breath of God down my neck. I've heard the echo and the grief of God against the doctrines of demons and the standards of Satan being set up in the house of God. And I've heard these young men wave off angels, they've walked off prophets, and they said to me, we don't care how much you pray, we don't care what you've heard, we don't care how loud you preach, we're the new rock and roll prophets of this age, we are the one that God's setting up and making popular, we are the new standards of the church. I've been told that till I can't take it anymore. They're hats at God's. I'm going to show it to you very clearly tonight before we're over. They're saying these are the new standards. This is the way God is moving. He said these new adversaries have a hatchet in their hand. It's as if a man goes into a forest. Now, you understand, don't you, that the Bible makes men a type of trees. When man is healed, he said he saw men as trees walking. And they're all, I can give you probably 25 references of, of men as trees. And here are those who have an axe in their hand. And they're not only setting up their own standards, but they're... They have one purpose in mind. And they've got an axe in their hand. They have a hatchet according to this prophecy. And they're going through this kind of church. They're going through the church shopping like a man with an axe in the forest. Like one walking with an axe in a forest of trees. Now all the carved wood they smash with a hatchet and with a hammer. They smash them down. They come parading through our towns and their concerts. They come parading through our churches. They come parading through their records and their magazines and their tapes. They come parading with their special messages incubated in hell. A message without holiness, a message without separation. Not only setting up their own standards, but come with hatchets in their hands. He said they've made up their minds to tear down and burn and destroy all the old standards. The scripture says they have burned the sanctuary to the ground. They've defiled the dwelling place of thy name. They said in their heart, let us completely subdue them. Let us completely subdue them. Let's take control. Let's subdue it. Let's bring it under our authority. And then this cry goes up, we don't see our signs anymore. Our standards are beginning to evaporate. In other words, all the old standards of holiness and separation are disappearing. What was once black and white is all gray now. Who are these stooges of the devil? Who are these with hatchets in hand, setting up new evil standards and tearing down the holy standards? Who are these who damage everything in sight, according to the 74th so, these are the false prophets who've been deceived by Satan himself. They're possessed by a spirit of the hatchet gods. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know they're tearing down. Because God says, when you don't walk with me in covenant, if you give yourself over to a lying spirit, I'll smear over your eyes. I'll take your discernment from your eyes. And they don't even know what they're doing. They don't know they're preaching another Jesus and preaching another gospel. Go with me to 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. First Timothy 4. Young people, please get your Bible. Please look at it with me. I want to point you to the scripture. I want to point you to the word of God. First Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Listen to it. Hear it. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, 
Some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceived spirits and doctrines of demons. Is that in your Bible? By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own consciences with a branding iron. Do you see that? Will you admit with me that in the last days, according to Timothy, there will come doctrines of demon and seducing spirits into the church? How many see that in your Bible? Young people, do you see it? I can't go on with you until you acknowledge that that's in your Bible, that you see it in black and white. In case you don't have your Bible, I'll read it to you again. But the Spirit explicitly says, in the latter times, are we living in the last days? Some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own consciences with the branding iron. All right, go with me, please, to 2 Corinthians. Go left, please, to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Second Corinthians 11. I, I'm going to start reading at the second verse. First, second Corinthians, second Corinthians 11 chapter, beginning to read the second verse. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betroth you to one husband, that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid. Lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit or another gospel which you have not received, of a different gospel which you have not accepted, and you bear this beautifully, would you, would you acknowledge with me, did you hear of this, that there's another Jesus? Did you hear that? Did it say there's another gospel? I, there are doctrines of demons. There are lying spirits in the house of God. And look at this. They're going to come preaching. 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 Another Jesus. Another gospel. It's that there it is in its age. All right, go with me to verse 13. Verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disgui disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, is it not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds? Now that puts a chill down my back. Doctrines of demons, lying spirits, and those who come, the devil himself coming as an angel of light, preaching another Jesus, another gospel. Doesn't the Bible say that on the judgment day many, many will come and say, Lord, we healed the sick, many were sick, we healed them, we cast out devils, we did mighty works. What they're saying is, we lined up thousands of people and they were healed. We cast out devils and people were saved and healed. Devils were cast out. We had great results. We did mighty works in your name. We had great concerts and the altars were filled. And the Lord said, depart from me, you're working, I never knew you. You preached another gospel, another Jesus. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Servants of righteousness? Come along and gush sweetly the name of Jesus. Come along and say, come with me, serve Jesus. But it's not the Jesus of the cross. It's not the gospel of holiness. It's out of the pits of hell. It's of a lying, deceptive spirit. And the church had better get back its holy discernment. Right? Is it becoming clear that there are doctrines of demons, that there are going to be angels of light come preaching a new Jesus, a new gospel, coming as ministers of righteousness? They're going to appear holy, they're going to appear righteous, their words are right, but their hearts are not right with God because they're sin in their life. Just like the call I got this week from one of the top rock Christian groups, so-called Christian rock groups. 
the number one. And one of the members called, a friend of mine who called me and said, the band's a bit to break up because one of them's getting right with God and he can't stand the others bringing prostitutes into their rooms. Brother, sister, God's about to move in this thing. God's about to tear down some things. Elvis, the king of its dead, and God was saying something when he took John Lennon and Elvis Presley. God was making a statement, and we didn't hear it. Go to Romans 3. I'll tell you, I have a holy boldness because I've got the word of God standing behind me. God walks in covenant with this word. Hallelujah. I'm not mad at you, young people. And I'll tell you, I'm going to get to the parents in just a minute. You better believe it. Romans 3, 8. I'm going to start reading Romans 3rd chapter and 8th verse. And why not say, as we are slanderous reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, their condemnation is just. Are we better than they? Not at all. For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Now here it is. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Now look at that. Now, uh, you know that God has a people in the land, don't you? You know that you're seeking God, don't you? Well, how can you look at that and it says there's none seeking God when you know you're seeking God? I'll tell you why. Because if you read this, he's talking about these who are ministers of the devil. He's talking about the false ministers. There's not one of them, he's saying. Not one of them. Now, I want you to listen to the description of these who preach another gospel, another Jesus. Look at this. There's none of them that are righteous. Not even one. There's none who understands. For there's none who seeks for God. All of them have turned aside. Altogether they become useless. There's none of them who does good. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They're singing out of an open grave. You look down what they're singing in the inner man and you see a grave. You see bones. Dead bones. They sound like they're singing of Jesus. And Jesus said, it's an open sepulcher. The throats are graves. And their tongues, with their tongues, they keep deceiving. Amy Grant, this summer wife, preaching to alcoholics on the street. Her posters everywhere. Sponsored by Miller Beer. And how you kids can buy those kind of records, I don't understand. And I say right now, I love Amy Grant with all my heart. But I'm saying it loud and clear. When Amy Grant said she's building a bridge between the secular and the spiritual, what does she intend to do? Bring our young people across the bridge into the secular? No! Never! The throat is an open grave and their tongues they keep deceiving. Oh, brother, sister, young people, if you love those singers, pray for them. Love them and pray for them that God will not let them be deceived anymore by the enemy. Pray for them, love them and reach out. The poison of a serpent is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery in their paths. And the path of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's what you have it. If there was a dread of the holiness of God, if they'd seen His righteousness, they could not dare do these things. Never. Do you have the jealousy of a jealous God in your heart? Come on now. Do you know that we serve a jealous and holy God? Do you share that jealousy for the honor of God? Does not your spiritual blood boil when you see His honor defamed? Amen. Who's Paul describing here now? Who are we talking about in the 74th chapter of Psalms also the adversaries of God with a hatchet tearing down God's holy standards? Well, the Bible is always a commentary on itself. The Bible explains itself. I'm, don't turn, but I'm just going to quote to you James 4.4. 4. Just listen to it now. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to God. He that would be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to God. And there's no enemy of God whose throat is anything other than an open sepulcher. 
We're so afraid of judging sin. We're so afraid to cry out to the honor of God. Lift up His holy name and cry out against the sins and abominations of this land. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Go with me to 2 Corinthians, please. Go right. 2 Corinthians. 6th chapter. Let me ask you, how many love the Word of God? Raise your hand. Do you love it? All right, now look this way before we read it. This is, this is what the hatchet gods are after. Do you know that the hatchet gods cannot succeed until they tear down this standard? This is the number one goal. Every time these Christian punkers come to me and I lay this down, they blink and they gulp and they say, well, that's not what it means. And they try to tear it down, but you can't get away from this standard. Young people, this is the rock on which you're going to build your faith. This is a holy standard of God. And this is what the hats of God's have to turn down. They've got to knock this standard down. Read it with me here, please. First, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, we begin to read. 14th verse, right down through to 18. Don't get ahead of me, just follow me. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? For what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony is Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. Then I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Says the Lord God Almighty. That seals it. What's it say, young people? What fellowship do you have with the world? What fellowship with those idols? What do you have to do with that idolatry? You shall not do it. You shall come out from among them. You shall be separate and clean. Then I receive you as my son and daughter. And that is what the hats of God's going to try to tear down. They're after that. They're going through the house of God with their hatchets. And you know what they say? Well, Jesus mixed with sinners. Jesus, this, this, is the, this is the number one ploy. This is the greatest deception among this whole crowd. They say, I'm like Jesus. Jesus said he came to uh, minister to the sinners. In the first place, I'm going to give you a scripture that's going to knock that once and for all. Jesus, in the time of Christ, a Gentile was called a sinner. He was filthy. He was unclean. If a Levite, even his robe, even swished and touched the skin, he had to go and wash it. Because he was polluted by a sinner, a Gentile. What it's saying is Jesus ministered to Gentiles. He went to their homes. Not once did he go into a den of iniquity. Not one time. You don't dare blame my Savior for that. He came to seek and save the sinners. But he was, this is talking primarily about those who are Gentiles. Those who were called sinners among the people, but they had a heart for God. Every one of those he's talking about were reaching out to him while the Jews were forsaking him. These sinners were accepting. They were reaching out. They were mocking him. They were reaching out to him. All right, go with me to Hebrews 7. I want to, I want to end this controversy once and for all. Go to Hebrews. Thank God for the Word. We don't have to guess. we got the Word to stand on, young people. I want you to go to Romans 7.26. Romans 7.26. Hear the word of the Lord, saints. Romans, or Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews. Did I say Romans? I want Hebrews. I'll give you a little extra time there. Oh, I love the leaves. I love the rustling of the leaves. Sounds like music. Hallelujah. Romans 7. I, I'm sorry, Hebrews 7. I got Romans 7. I better find out what Romans 7 means there. <laughs> well, I was just wondering if the Lord trying to say something here. 
You go, you go to Hebrews. Hebrews, <laughs> Hebrews 7, 26. There isn't a Romans 7, 26. Stop at 25. <laughs> that means he nailed down Hebrews. Read it, folks. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, and what? What? I can't hear you. Uh-huh. Separated. There was a wall. He loved them, but he never came down out of his righteousness. He never was a protector of their sins. It was a wall of separation, separated from sinners. Holy, undefiled, separated from sinners. Oh, glory be to God. Right? Who, who are these people that, are, that, are, that have a hatchet in their hand? I say, well, I'm going to uh, get to the parents right away. Oh, boy. I love it when parents see me preaching to the kids and I can just see them clapping and saying, give it to them, brother. Just give it to them. And then when I get down on them, they just sit there and almost dare me. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you something, dad, mom, don't you dare. Don't you dare put your foot down on your kids rock and roll when you're sitting in front of your own idol. And don't you dare talk about their rock and roll. You listen to that filthy garbage called country western with all the cheating and all the incest. The most ungodly lyrics in the world are not rock and roll, they're country western. A few weak amens from some parents under conviction. <laughs> Eli had two sons, half nine friends. They were a part of the ministry. They ministered in the house of God, but they were phonies. And this father knew they were phonies. He saw them laying with women at the temple door. He saw them reach into the seething pot and take out the filling me on. He saw their cheating. He saw what was happening. And the scripture says, God sent a prophet to this man, Eli, and he said, In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I've spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. His sons brought a rebuke, on, a reproach on themselves and he did not rebuke them. And you'll find this all through the scriptures. You'll find the most devout parents, holy parents, refusing to cross their children. Would you turn to 1 Kings with me, please? Go all the way back to 1 Kings, please. I've, I've got to have you just look at this. Because it'll jump out at you. 1 Kings, please. The first chapter of 1 Kings. I know some of you are getting bored, but I, I just want you to... Folks, I, I marvel at the way the Holy Word of God works its wonder in our hearts. A man can get up and preach his heart out, but it won't do it. It's the Word. And I give you this Word now from the death of I'm not trying to grandstand tonight, and I'm not being facetious. I have a broken heart for our kids. I'm tired of the devil squandering our kids and destroying them and deceiving them. And God's raising up some voices. I'm just one of those voices, but I want it heard tonight. Look at verse, 1 Kings, first chapter. Start with the fifth verse. Now, now, first Kings, first chapter, fifth verse. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I'll be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with 50 men to run before him. And his father had never crossed him at any time by asking, why have you done so? Never once did David, was David a man after God's own heart? Was he holy and pure and righteous? But he had a son by the name of Adonijah. Not one time did he cross that boy. Dad, Mom, look me in the eye now. You can just lay your Bible on your lap and look me in the eye. Dad, 
You may be a holy man of God. You may love the Lord with all your heart. But when's the last time you went into the bedroom of your son and you looked at that poster on the wall of Van Halen or you look at that poster of some other demonic rock and roll God and when's the last time you crossed that boy and say, what's the meaning of that? What do you mean by that? Are oh, you mean to say now that that has a place in your life? Mother, when's the last time you went to the room of your teenage daughter and you went through those record jackets and you looked at all those demonic covers? Have you ever seen some of those covers lately? Even of the so-called Christian groups? Have you seen the serpents and the signs, the zodiac signs? Have you seen the serpent kind visions of hell? When's the last time you've held them up and trembled and say, Honey, tell me what this means. Does this mean that you don't love the Lord anymore? Does this mean that you bring into my house the doctrines of demons? Come on, Mother. Come on, Dad. Adonijah died. Lost. The son of a man who God said he's a holy man after my own heart. I see preachers' kids dying and going to hell because their fathers say, Oh, Brother Dean, don't get so worked up. Our, our generation had its music. That this is just a stage that kids go through. They'll outgrow it. You better wake up, Dad and Mom. They're not going to outgrow it. There's a power of the devil in this thing and it has to be broken. I've had somebody of God's parents in Dallas, Texas. And it's been brought back to me. I've been called a false prophet right in the Assembly of God Church as a false prophet because I'm taking this stand. And, and I, I weep inside not of what they're saying to me, but I weep with their blindness because I know two or three churches in Dallas where the young people are going to hell. The big thing now in the mar married couples is trading wine lists. They're going now to nightclubs. They're going to country western clubs and they're drinking their champagne and their cocktails. And they call that freedom. And they let their kids do what they please. And they said, Brother Wilkerson is all mixed up. Pray for him. No, Dad and Mother. If you allow that in your house, you're the one that's blinded. God demands of you that you go in there and take holy dominion. You say, I don't want to upset my children. You better upset them. You better take that stand. Better to get them mad now than to lose them to hell. Is it time to do that when there's 11, 12 years old? Do you even know what kind of music your kids are listening to? Do you have any idea? Dad, Mom, you're so wrapped up in your own problems. Are you so wrapped up that you can't sit down there and look at it? About, about 25 years ago, I was going to write a book on how to raise kids. Because all, all books on how to raise kids are written by young men who don't have kids. All the experts are those who've never done it. But I waited until all my kids are grown and married. All four of my children in the ministry. The last one in college going to the ministry. And I thank God for that. And I, I thought I'd do some research and I set them down on the floor. These are married kids now and I'm, I'm saying, I'm thinking of writing a book. And we're so proud of you. You've, you're serving the Lord. We, I see Jesus in you. I'm so proud of the Lord. What did we do right? And I thought it was going to be all those long talks I had and all these special messages and everything else. And I'm just ready to enjoy the fruit of my labors. <laughs> and they, everyone was quickly said, that's easy, Dad. Mom was always there when we came home from school. <laughs> now, you may laugh at that, but I'm going to tell you. You kids, when you come home, that's just an anchor. They'll come home and just, hey, mom, and they know she's there. There's an anchor. They may go to the, the ice box and get their cookies and milk and go out and play with their friends, but there's a security. There's somebody there. But then, Gary, I have a son who pastors a, a, a ghetto church in Detroit, primarily a black congregation. They call him the blackest white man in Detroit. He's loved blacks ever since he was a child. Always brought his black friends home from school. And you know, uh, he's the one that's written up in the cross of Switchblade, uh, the story about it. And, and then one after another, they almost heartbroken. I mean, with, with just tears. He said, Dad, really, honestly, when we were going through hard times and trials, you loved us enough. We heard you cry over us. 
And then when you'd call us in and say, into my office, and when we'd sit on the floor Indian fashion for those hours, and you never rebuked us, you always said, I was praying about you last night, God told me something about you, I'm going to give you the word. And over the years, I brought the word of God to their hearts. And I stood it right there. And I said, if you want to cross it, it's fine, but you're not crossing your dad. Now you're crossing this word. And the fear of God was implanted in their hearts. Dad and mother, we're damning a generation to hell because we don't even know what our kids are doing anymore. Get your nose in there. Get involved. Find out what kind of friends are running around. Find out what kind of music they're listening to. Get involved! Otherwise, you have the hatchet in your hand. You're destroying them. Their standards through neglect are being torn apart. I also blame soft soap preaching in the pulpit. Now, before you say man, just hear me out, please. I, I know I say man too on this, but brother, sister, I've got to get this on my heart. I can say this freely because I know this man behind me has a burden for souls. But there is an effeminate preaching in America today, very effeminate. Pastors and evangelists who are afraid to touch anybody and hurt them. First of all, because it's going to hurt the offering. Not serious, no laughing, no clapping or anything else. There's so many churches that have such burdens that if there's a cry that goes out from the pulpit, if people are not ready to go on with God, temporarily the budget goes down. Or it'll come back tenfold over when the purity comes. But there, there are some, not many, thank God, but there are some in the land who will not cry out against the sins of our young people. There are so few fearless preachers in the pulpit and a man who stand in the breach for the Lord. Go to Psalm 79. I'll show you something. Come on, let's go to Psalm. I, I get scared every time I get off the word a little bit. I'm not, as, I'm not on good ground until I get back here. Psalm 79. Friends, I, I trembled when I first saw this. The Holy Ghost led me to this verse when he was giving me this message. Just as clear as a still small voice said, David, go to Psalm 79. I'll show it to you. O oh God, the nations have invaded thine inheritance. They've defiled the holy temple. They've, this is Psalm 79. They've laid Jerusalem. Who's Jerusalem, by the way? Who, who is Israel? I told you last night. We are Israel. All right. They have given the dead bodies of thy servants for food to the birds of the heavens. The flesh of the godly ones to the beast of the earth. To the beast of the earth. Go back now to 74. Psalm 74. Just go left now to 74. The chapter I read to you. Verse 9. We do not see our signs, our ensigns, our standards. There is no prophet, no longer any prophet. Nor is there any among us who knows how long. How long, O oh God, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn thy name forever? All right, look this way, please. I've read to you right now a scripture that says there's a ruin in Jerusalem in the holy place. They've given the dead bodies of thy servants for food to the birds of the heaven. Who do you think the birds of the heavens are? The fowls of the earth that come and steal the word of God. Who are these creeping things? They're demonic powers. The scripture said the flesh of thy godly ones have been given to the beast of the earth. All right, if you will, now go to Deuteronomy 28. I'm going to tie it down for you. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Are you still with me? All right, Deuteronomy 28. Let's go to verse 25. Listen, hear the word of the Lord. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them, but you shall flee seven ways before them. And you shall be an example of terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And your carcasses shall be food for all birds of the sky and to the beasts of the earth. And there shall be no one to frighten them away. Listen to it. There'll be the birds of the air, the fowls, the money powers coming. There's not a prophet. There's no one to scare them away. That thunders to the depths of my inner man. 
God with all the powers of hell that have been released. And I don't glorify the devil. I've stood for years in the pulpit ridiculing men who talked about the powers of the enemy. I didn't even know there was a warfare. Because I was living in the flesh. And the flesh ties out against that kind of preaching. But friends, God's made me a war, made me, a, made me aware of the fowls of the air that have come to rob this generation of the gospel, of the true gospel, of the true Christ. And he's bringing the doctrines of demons and these fowls of the air, these creeping things, the principalities and powers of darkness. And they're here, and if God needs anything, he needs men who can scare those birds away from the pulpits. No one to fight those birds away. Well, thank God he's raising them up. I think one of the greatest dangers in the church today is what I see in many, many churches and among evangelists. It's human compassion. Human compassion that extends mercy before the sin is dealt with. I can't offer you, I can't offer you his glory and his peace and his joy until there's repentance in your heart. He offers it freely to all men. But I ministered for years blinded by my human compassion. Human compassion. I don't see that in this pulpit. I hear more than that. It goes far beyond because I've, I've, God's given me a discerning eye and I'm seeing things. I, there's a certain sound that I see and hear in Pastor Benson that gives me freedom to preach what I'm preaching here tonight without fear. And I know there's nothing I can say can hurt him because he's walking in this realm or this church wouldn't be filled tonight. And there wouldn't be the freedom that we're sensing in the spirit right now because there's a cry for repentance. But you parents, don't you dare let your compassion rob you of the divine authority the divine authority over iniquity and sin hallelujah I tremble tonight and I weep before you in my heart to think of the years I thought I was such a loving evangelist and I was offering such love and just oozing with love I wanted to be loved most preachers want to be loved I didn't want anybody to be mad at me now I get a lot of people pre walking up I, thank God I haven't seen it here there must be some people here who want God most places 25, 30 people walk I get offended and I don't, I don't understand why they're offended because I love them so much I may sound loud I may hit this pulpit once in a while but my heart's grieving inside because I'm fighting for your kids dad, mom I'm fighting for young people I'm fighting for his righteousness and his holiness now a word to the young people I've talked about pastors and parents now now let me talk to you young people right out of my heart Satan and his hatchet demons have two goals in your life. They're trying to get you into a spirit of rebellion and baptize with the spirit of stubbornness. Now listen to me closely. There's a river where the devil takes people to baptize them. And that river is a river of rebellion. And when you are taken down into that river, he takes you by the hand. He's going to baptize you. He takes you down in that river of rebellion. All oh, the rebellion I've seen. And this is what scares me about the music of our young people. This is what scares me about what is called Christian rock and roll. The rebellion that goes with it. The stand up against parents. Stand up against preachers and say, you old fogey. Wave off angels. Wave off conviction. Wave off everything and say, don't touch my idol. That rebellion scares me. That rebellion tells me it's wrong. There's a spirit in it that's wrong. Young people, he's, you've got your foot in the river of rebellion. He's about to take you down and he's going to take you under. And when you come up, you're going to be baptized in a spirit of stubbornness with a hard heart. Do you know he can't get you in that river? Until he takes that tender heart you have toward the Lord and he pounds and pounds on it and he cuts and cuts with his hatchet gods and his hatchet demons he has to cut and cut and cut 
That doesn't mean you're possessed with those lying birds that fly through the air to pluck the very gospel you hear of truth and reality. They're there lying and lying and lying and bringing these evil thoughts, these voices out of open sepulchers and throats that have the poison of serpents in them. And he just tries to suck you into that river rebellion. And young people, you sit here right now and you ask yourself the question, are you mad at me? Are you a little upset because I'm talking about your favorite music? And you're sitting here saying, Brother Dave, you're touching some very wonderful people of God. I want you to know that I'm hearing from many groups now who said, David, you made me so mad I threw your book down. But when I went to prayer, the Holy Ghost said, he's right. Clean up your act. Clean it up. My Bible says, God says, the table of the Lord is so full of vomit, there's not a clean spot left on it where I can put a holy vessel. God looks at his table and it's full of vomit. Young people, if you're angry at me, where do you think that comes from? I'm up here having fasted and prayed, fighting for your soul, fighting against the deception the devil's trying to bring on you. Shouldn't you stop and ask yourself, where did that resentment come from? Why are you angry? They shook the fist at me. In Toronto, I had young people would let me go night after night, Brother D. You got it all wrong. You just don't understand. You don't understand. Your, your generation doesn't understand. I, there's nothing I could say because they won't listen. But that very day, Saturday, I preached this message in Toronto at the great cathedral there, Queensway Cathedral. And that day, the so-called Christian punk group from California just released its latest record in Toronto. And I can't even quote to you publicly. You blankety blank four letter words. You blankety blank cursed people are going to pay for rejecting the gospel. And those kids were shaken. Even the hardest of them said, Brother Dave, what's happening? What's happening? I know that's not God. Four letter words out of restrooms? In the name of Jesus? Young people, shouldn't you wake up and say, there's a deception somewhere? There's a doctrine of demon at work here? Mm. Go, Isaiah, Isaiah 63, quickly, Isaiah 63. Oh, God, make your word come to life now. God, make it come to life. I love these young people, Lord. Help us. Isaiah 63. I'm going to start reading verse 17. Why, O Lord, dost thou cause us to stray from thy ways and harden our hearts from fearing thee? Return for the sake of thy servants, the tribes of thine inheritance. The holy people possess thy sanctuary for a little while. Our adversaries have trodden it down. There it is again. The adversaries have come to trod it down. Now, this is not what it says in yours, but the original Hebrew reads just like this. Now, just look at me while I read this. You can look at that, but then here's what it says. We, we have become like those over whom thou hast never ruled, like those who were not called by thy name. We've become just like them. Young people, if you listen to it, you become just like them. That's what Isaiah, he said, that's the grief of the prophet's heart. I've become just like, that's why, that's why the New Testament cries up, be careful how you listen. Be careful to what you listen to. Be careful how you listen. I hear something out of heaven tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hold still for just a minute with me. Hallelujah. Go with me, First Samuel. Go all the way back to First Samuel. All right, 1 Samuel 15. 
Beginning at verse 22. Are you getting tired or can I give you just a little bit more? All right. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, As the Lord is much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is it the sin of what? Witchcraft. Rebellion. It's the same thing. Do you understand, young people, if you sit here with rebellion in your heart, that you've been seduced by the witchcraft of the enemy? You're under the spell of a witchcraft. And God wants to set you free from that tonight. Because you rejected, listen, for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Insubordination is iniquity and idolatry because you rejected the word of the Lord. He's also rejected you from being king. That was the word to Saul. Can I, 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 I guess I've got to give you one more. Deuteronomy 32, please. Go left to Deuteronomy. And this will be the last scripture I give you probably. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. I'm going to start reading verse 10. Deuteronomy 32, verse 10. He found him in a desert land, in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young. He spread forth his wings and he caught them. He carried them on his own wings. The Lord alone guided him. I'm reading from Deuteronomy 32. This is a picture of your salvation. The Lord said, I found you in sin. I put you in my arms and my wings and I carried you safely. I loved you. I brought you in. Go to verse 15. But Jeshurun, that's Israel, that's the people of God. 32, 15. But Jeshurun, which means the people of God, grew fat and kicked. You've grown fat and thick and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him. You scorned the rock of your salvation. You made him jealous with your strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God. To gods that they have not known. To new gods that have come up lately. Whom your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock who begot you. And you forgot the God who gave you birth. And the Lord saw this and he spurned them. Because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. Then he said, I'll hide my face from them. I'll see what their end shall be. For their perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness. They've made me jealous with what's not of God. They provoke me to anger with their idols. So I'll make them jealous with those who are not a people. <clears throat> Look this way, please. Look at me. He said, there's new gods that have come up lately. You've turned away from me. You've made me jealous. You sit there with your music. You get so wrapped and enraptured in it. You so admire and love and respect those musicians. And you make me jealous. All oh, that I could have that time of yours. All oh, that you could just turn on a, a worship song. A pure worship of the name of Jesus. All oh, that you could give your heart to me in fullness. I found you when you were in sin. I found you when you're in despair and lonely and sick. And I brought you in. But now you don't seek me days on end. You neglect me. And now there are new gods of this new age that have come up. And God watches his people sit for hours in front of their Babylonian idiot boxes. He watches you sit there hour on end in front of your television set. And you make him so jealous. He says, oh, that if you'd just give me that time... Oh, that you had a heart for me. And folks, I'm going to keep obeying the Holy Ghost. I would just as soon stand in this pulpit and bless you. You don't know how hard it is to stand night after night and thunder the Word of God and have your heart burning and your heart breaking because you see some things that God shows you. God let me see underneath the surface. And I can see people all over America, even as somebody had got people. 
the worship service sounds so sweet. And it sounds, I, I listen to the reports of all the great things God's doing, but the underbelly is corrupt. Because those same people are going home after talking in tongues and seeking the face of God and going home and watching abominable filth out of hell. How do you watch that filth? How do you watch that filth? When he said, you'll set no wicked thing before your eyes. You'll bring no abomination into your home and you'll walk in holiness in your household. The Sodomites couldn't get into Sodom's house, but they're sure getting into ours. There was an angel who had authority, but the angel of authority is gone from our homes. You go to some Christian homes and you can hardly stand the noise. Rock music upstairs and an idol downstairs. Until God finds a people who cast, who smashes every idol. Until God sees that people won't get mad at this kind of preaching anymore. And I'm just going to keep saying, I didn't ask, I didn't ask this church or this pastor for a dime. My last offering in Toronto, the Lord told me to give it away because I preached such strong messages. I wasn't going to let the devil tell anybody it's there for money. I've not made a single demand on this church. I've not said one word about money. You don't hear me selling books or tapes. I came here to deliver my soul. And I'm telling you, saints. God is going to take his glory. He said, I'm going to take the voice of the bride away. And he won't let it go on much longer. He's saying it to the staff of this church. And he's saying it to everyone who belongs to this house. Get rid of your idols. Cleanse your hands. Don't keep crying. Don't keep repenting until you look your idols in the eye and say, Go! Away! And you take back that spiritual authority. Last night... I was surrounded with wives in the prayer room, weeping. I said, Brother Wilkerson, my husband is bringing pornography in the house. He's not saved. Or others say, Brother Dave, I feel that way, but my husband doesn't. And one woman said, my family expects me. That it's the only time we have together. My family expects me. I get letters from so many hundreds of wives saying, my husband threatens to leave me if I don't sit and watch with him in the evenings. Watch every filthy thing. Mother, if you keep on, you're going to lose the last bit of spiritual authority in that home. If your husband's not saved, it's up to you to take that spiritual authority. And you go into that prayer closet while in there and you seek the face of God. Your husband may growl for a while, but you're raising up a spiritual arm in that house with a holy scepter. And by prayer, you can smash that idol out of your house without saying a word. Your young people will come back. getting letters from thousands now who say, David, when I tore down all the idols, I didn't understand at first, it made me angry, but when we did, my marriage was healed because the idols were gone. And the Holy Ghost is coming after our idols. He's not going to let you get by and say, hey, Brother David, that's not an idol. That's your idea of an idol. Come on, you look me in the eye. You tell me in all Holy Ghost intelligence and discernment that that's not evil now. You tell me there's not filth coming out of the very gates of hell now flooding in. You tell me the MTV and all those video things are not demonic. Tell me that. Look me in the eye and tell me that, saints. And how are you going to deal with your kids? Now, I've got a question I've got to ask you. Dad and mom, especially the young people, God told me to ask it of you. It's a question he asked Peter. And I will tell you something. Here's what I love about my Jesus. Peter denied the Lord. And you see Peter walking the hills weeping. He says, oh, my God, I denied. I, I denied God. I betrayed God Almighty because He's God in the flesh. I betrayed God. How would you like that hanging over your head? And he weeps. He walks the hills weeping. You know what I love about Jesus? Peter is trying to console himself and he goes fishing. He said, I go fishing. And he's broken hearted. He said, I've denied God. I've reproached Him. 
You talk about idolatry. He was an idolater. But Jesus is on the beach cooking a fish. And he sees Peter out in that boat. This is what I love about Jesus. <laughs> if your heart's willing and he sees repentance from the heart. What do you think when he looked out at Peter? What do you think he did? Peter! You reprobate! Come here! No. See, repentance had already worked its sweet work in his life. You know what he said? Peter! Come and die. Come and die. Come eat with me. Peter very timidly rose to the shore. Get his head down. And the master hugs him. Flays off a piece of the cooked fish. And said, Peter, eat. And young people, God told me to ask you a question. And this is what it boils down to. It's not a matter of rock and roll. It's not a matter of the music itself either. It goes beyond that. He said, Peter, do you love me more than all this? More than all these? Do you love me more than your music, young people? Do you love me more than your friends? Do you really love me? That's where it comes down. That's the bottom line. It's all about love. And if your heart's repentant, the thunder stops. The lightning stops. The loud voices stop. And that begins to work its way into the heart. And God sees that godly soul and He sees that repentant heart. And He says, come on, son. Come on, daughter. Come eat with me. Come and die. Isn't that beautiful? Come and die. That's really what this is all about. It's about a pure heart and clean hands. Why does God cause a servant to stand and thunder his word because he's looking for clean hands and a pure heart and he's got to get our attention. The word is a hammer. It's a hammer. Until that hammer does its work, until every idol is smashed, it's not completed its work. Now come against those idols in Jesus' name tonight. A lot of you parents in this church, members of this congregation, are going to have to make up your mind. You're going to have to deal with what I'm preaching. Either I'm a liar or I've heard from God. And if what I say here from God, you'd better hear it. You'd better hear it. He's come against your idols. All of our idols. And I was the worst abuser of all of you. That's right. I'd preach to thousands and go home to my motel room, wherever I was at, and watch those R-rated movies. And wake up and ask God to forgive me. But see, God had to do something in my heart. And when he got my heart, that wasn't a problem anymore. When he got all my heart, I love to hear preaching now of reproof because I've come to the light and just blesses me. Oh, I love repentance now because it's so glorious. Repentance works up such glory in my life. It brings such joy. It brings such release. I can look all the devils and demons in hell in the eye and say, Wicked one, you come and touch me not. You've got nothing in me. Nothing left. Hallelujah. The wicked one come and have nothing in me. That's what repentance is all about. To work its sweet work so the glory can fall. And when glory is completed, these altars in this church will be lying from side to side. People, honest, getting saved in every service. Brokenness, repentance. Your children will get saved. Your families, your sons, daughters, your uncles and your aunts. Your whole house will get saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to open the altars in just a minute. You know what's been blessing me? I've preached for 25 years and didn't see grandmas and grandpas coming to the altar. In this past six months when God has laid these messages of repentance on my heart, we saw it last night. I've seen it everywhere. Grandmas and grandpas down weeping with all the young people, crying out to God, cleansing, purifying their hearts. Oh, I wish, I wish that could happen to a grandma in Texas. His mother wrote to me, heartbroken letter, David, you know John. You remember when he's a boy, you took him in your arms. Now that boy's grandma was a great missionary. She and her husband 
were great Assembly God missionaries. I don't dare name them. Most of you would know them. But he died. They were on a mission field for 50 years. And she came home a little peeved at God for taking him. And that little boy grew up in the front pew listening to Grandma preach. He thought she's the greatest preacher on the face of the earth. That Grandma would preach like a house of fire and say, God will keep you to your dying day. There's grace sufficient to see you through to the grave. She came home, moved in with her daughter and her grandson, and sat in front of the television set in a rocker, and for the next three years become addicted to the soaps and all the filth. The fire is gone. Five years went by, and that boy came home from college, and he saw the bitterness. He saw what those soaps were doing to his grandma, that mighty preacher of the gospel. And he knelt beside her, and almost word for word, Grandma, I hate your God. I hate what's happening to you. I hate to see you sit here. All my life I grew up admiring you. You kept preaching that God can keep you to the grave. Why can't He keep you? And that boy turned atheist. A preacher's son. Grandma, where's that fire you had? Where's that weeping spirit? Come on. You grew up in that. You grew up in fire. You grew up in glory. What are you doing sitting there in front of an idol? I'm not preaching against television. I'm preaching against idolatry. I'm preaching against that sucking, that which is sucking our very spiritual life out of us and making us zombies. And a spirit of sleep is coming upon us. A dead sleep. Grandpa, you were a father in Zion. Our young people need you. They need you back at the cross. They need you coming in the house of God, having come from the prayer chamber. You've touched heaven. And they can see Jesus in you. They see Jesus in you. And not 18. I tell you, I have lost all concern about what people think of me anymore. And I'm not grandstanding now that I just, what's the purpose of my coming here? What's the purpose of my preaching? What's the purpose of a meeting like this? If God doesn't take us beyond the tears, beyond words, He said you have the right words. Oh, that you had a heart! Oh, that you had a heart to serve me! And until God breaks that, my being here is in vain! Until I see grandpas, those old soldiers of the cross and grandmas on their knees, and those idle smacks, shut the door! Shiloh, Ichabod! All the singing and shouting doesn't mean a thing in the sight of God. All the singing and choir means nothing. Because our hands are burning in idols. We sit for hours watching film, pulling our hearts and our eyes, and putting our kids upon their hands. I do the thunder of God. been deceived. Lord, I don't know what to do, not accept to talk. Lord, I've tried to love these people. I've, I don't know where to go but to open these altars. I don't even know what to say anymore, God. I feel your grief against our idolatry, our foolishness. We say we love you, we don't love you. Lord, we don't love you. If we did, we'd hate these things. We'd hate them. 
we wouldn't be defending them, we wouldn't be justifying them, we'd hate them. We'd hate them. Oh God, we'd hate them. <laughs> the altars are open. Oh God. Rick, all right. <laughs> Young people of God's talking to you, get down here and get it right with God. Lay down your idol up in the balcony here in the main floor. Come on, you fill up the front here if you want. We're going to turn this church into an altar tonight. You can call it emotionalism, call it anything you want, but God's calling for a people to humble themselves, lay down their idols and get their hearts right with God. Come on, young people, up on stage here if you have to. Get right behind me here. I'll lay hands on you and pray with you. Come on. You can make an altar right where you're at. You can make an altar right where you're at. If you're backslidden, you've been running from God, get back to Jesus now. Get back. Hold steady now, please. Hold steady. Get back right now to Him. Get back to Jesus. Get back to your first love. Hallelujah. Get back to your first love. Hallelujah. You can come up here on stage even. There's a place to kneel here. You can come up here. Come on, son. I want to pray with you. Right down there. That's fine. Young people up in the balcony, in the main floor, wherever you're at. Let Him work His work in your heart right now. Jesus. Jesus. You can kneel right in the aisles. Just kneel right in the aisles. You can kneel right where you're at. Just kneel. You don't even have to come up here. Folks, everyone in this audience, would you make an altar right where you are for just a moment now and call on the Lord and renew your heart and say, Lord, I want my idols out of my life. Make a commitment, say to God, everyone in this house that loves the Lord, turn this house for just a moment into an altar. If you want to just lean forward, just, just lean forward in that pew and say, Lord, I... I Make a commitment now. I hear what the Holy Spirit says. I read my heart and not my garments. Oh, Holy Spirit, breathe on us. Come against our idols and tear them apart. Bring us purity and holiness. Not legalism, but holiness. Holiness, righteousness in Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless. Folks, hold steady a minute. The Holy Spirit's just moving among us. He's moving among us. Lord, minister your life to us now. Cleansing, healing. Glory be to Jesus. Young people, what about your music? Deal with it now. What about all the idols? Deal with it now in Jesus' name. Lord, take everything out of my life that's unlike you. Come against my idols. Come against my idols.
I want us all to stand now, please. I just feel led of the Lord. Everyone who came forward, everybody in the audience, stand, please. Son, what's happening inside of you? Why are you up here? Huh? You want to go all the way with it? Have you laid everything in the altar? Your music? You sure? Have you, son? You think so? Has it been pretty heavy on you? It really gets a hold, doesn't it? It feels like it. Are you ready to lay it down at his feet? Do you love him more? That's what scares me, that that's such a battle with you right now and so many others. It's such a battle. It shouldn't have to be. That, that scares me because it's so deep now. But it blesses me when I see young men like yourself just say, Jesus, take it all. Lord, take it. Replace it, Lord, with a heart for you like he's never known of tenderness and righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Do you go to this church? Why did you come forward? You want to serve him? Hadn't you been serving? Huh? Why? What happened? You were just pulled away? Have you come back to him tonight? Don't be afraid to cry, honey. Forget your mascara. Just let, let, come on. That, I'm not being facetious. Just, just let him, have, let it all out right now. Love him from your heart. Oh, I tell you what. I see two boys that just looking like my. Uh, both boys. Yeah, I better get my glasses on. Right back there. Come here. Come on up here with me. Uh huh. Up here. <coughs> Oh, this is what this meeting is all about, that God save a whole generation. God save a whole generation. How old are you, son? You go to this church? Where do you go? Faith. Where do you go? Well, your buddies? You're not brothers. Come on closer. How old are you? I have five grandsons, and I have two of them that are nine, or eight and nine. They both have blonde hair, and that's, I guess I was drawn to you. Uh, did you hear what I said about music and idols? What did Jesus say to you tonight? Put them down. Is, is this one of your idols, son? Just beginning? And you, son? Uh, do you know everything that you lay down, it gives you something better in its place? You know that? Hmm? Hey, don't for a minute think they're listening to hard rock. That's not what it is. No, it's just all the friends. They're, they're into all that stuff, aren't they? A lot of friends in school. You get around the other side of me. Come on over here. I'm going to pray for you.